Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers Podcast with your host, Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers Podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics, including health, fitness, and training strategies, to name a few. If you enjoy the show and wish to support, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon or wish to make a one-time donation, please visit the show PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. Links to both of those can be found in the show notes. Also, consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform and on our video version of the show hosted on YouTube. For updates and notifications, please visit my social media channels at Zach Bitter on Instagram, at ZBitter on Twitter, and at Zach.Bitter on Facebook. If you wish to sponsor the show or have any other questions or feedback, please reach out to me at HPOPodcast at gmail.com. All right, folks, welcome back. Another episode of HPO Podcast. Today, I'm welcoming in uh, uh, Douglas Hilbert, and Douglas, if you don't know him, is someone who has been working closely with Verda. So we've done some topics and some podcasts on Verda in the past. I want to say maybe the last one was Dr. Jeff Stanley, if I'm not mistaken, uh, came in and kind of shared some stuff about, uh, about Verda and kind of their ins and outs and how they've leveraged a low-carbohydrate way of eating to you know, essentially work with a lot of people on diabetes and just kind of how can you manage that through nutrition. And it was really an interesting kind of platform for me to follow along over the years because they kind of leveraged uh, online presence more or less. So it kind of connected people with professionals in a way that I think was very new at the time and is continuing to get more common, but it was a little bit of a pioneer path, I think. And, uh, you know, Douglas is going to kind of chat with us a little bit with that, as well as some other aspects that Verda offers outside of maybe the nutrition coaching. But Doug, thanks for uh, taking some time and coming on HPO. Oh yeah, absolutely, Zach. And that's been great following, following you online. And we've chatted a few times and, you know, I've got an endurance uh, sport background. So yeah. it's fun to kind of dabble on. I know. I was thinking about that because we've chatted in the past and I, you've been kind enough to, to, to take a part in some of my consultations. So um, it, it is fun to just to chat with folks who kind of have some interesting more than one passion or one, more than one interest that's similar because you, you end up tying a lot of stuff together and get a kind of a fun conversation going with that sort of stuff. So uh, I think maybe maybe to start just just so our listeners maybe have an idea because we've had folks come on in the past and just kind of share their lifestyle story in terms of like, well, what brought you to like a ketogenic diet, a low carb diet, a carnivore diet, whatever diet it had, they happened to be doing that had like kind of changed their their well-being for the better. Mm. And um, I mean, you have some experience, obviously, <laughs> with a low carbohydrate diet. So maybe just share with us a little bit about kind of how that path went for you. Yeah, it's a long, winding, circuitous path. So trying to <laughs> give the elevator pitch. Um, yeah, so I, I was an athlete my whole life, grew up predominantly playing uh, soccer, played other sports. And then in high school, uh, really got into track. I was actually a sprinter, 100, 200 meters, uh, avoided the 400 like the plague and got roped into the 800 a few times uh which really probably should have been my event and went to college on a soccer scholarship and played for four years and then my senior year when I was kind of released from the team it was a fall sport I'm like hey I'm gonna go over to that track team yeah I just had that um I mean it's just it was almost an identity you know that, that I'm an athlete kind of thing and what what am I going to do without sports you know I'm not really sure I didn't attempt to play pro the MLS had just started I certainly wasn't an MLS caliber player so I went over and ran track and then um you know when that ended it, it I think you hear this from professional athletes but also from amateur athletes is that there's that loss of identity hey I'm 21 years old this has been something I've done since I was five years old and uh I you know, actually really, really struggled with that, which led to a lot of excessive uh, alcohol consumption and uh, narcotic abuse. And I actually, I did my first uh, treatment center, literally, I mean, it was less than a month out after graduating college. And some of that was the environment of, hey, we're done, let's party. But yeah. I kind of took it to another level, which I had 
I'd really experienced in off seasons. Uh, so even in high school, you know, I, I wrestled, I played racquetball one year just to have something to do sports wise, just to have that outlet. And, um, when I came out of that treatment center, you know, obviously I had a lot of friends that were in endurance sports and stuff. And I had a buddy that's, you know, he had a bike and he's like, Hey, uh, you know, you're, you're not looking so great. You put on some pounds and uh, let's jump on the bike. And, you know, I was probably hooked from that first ride, even though I borrowed a hybrid bike from my dad and you know, he had a nice fancy road bike and I'm struggling. And I was just kind of hooked. I'm like, hey, hey, this is something I can do. Uh, no illusions about being competitive, you know, it's kind of a brand new thing I could throw myself into. And really from there, I think within three months we did our first triathlon and it's funny cause I knew how to swim as in not drowned, yeah. uh, but I certainly didn't know how to no swimming background at all. And we went to the YMCA and we're like, Hey, let's like swim for 400 yards. I, I thought I was going to die. I'm like, there's, <laughs> there's no way. And uh, so we completed the first one and it, it was really great. And in October, the Ironman's on, comes on TV, we're watching it. And I'm like, eh, I'm going to do that. We did a sprint triathlon granted. Right. You know, so it was like swim 400 yards and, you know, bike 10 miles and run two miles. And uh, yeah. So two years later, you know, just jumped in the deep end of endurance sports and, you know, really was hooked. And, um, you know, some of the audience is probably familiar with rich Roll. And, and he always talks about how, you know, people claim we're trading one addiction for another and yeah. he agrees. I completely agree. And I would say being addicted to endurance sports was certainly better than being addicted to alcohol and drugs. Um, yeah. So I raced for competitively all the way through Oh five. And probably the downside is having that addictive committed personality was, there was definitely a lot of overtraining, I had no idea what I was doing with nutrition, you know, in the early two thousands, it's Gatorade, cliff bars, goo, all, I mean, it was just like main liming carbohydrates. And a lot of people still do that and can be somewhat successful with it. I think. Um, but when life, life, you know, real life, adult life started, I say, um, you know, my daughter was born and had to get a job, you know, training kind of, kind of back down. And, you know, I just maintained that, that high carbohydrate diet. And then it wasn't necessarily junk food, right? You know, it wasn't donuts and, you know, candy and all that, but it was certainly heavy, you know, pasta, rice, bread, cereals. It, it, it's no problem to eat an entire cereal box in one sitting, right? <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah. The, the, what we did. Um, <laughs> you had to, had to get it all in. And just over the years um, between that and then a few relapses, back with alcohol and drugs, you know, I kind of found myself about, you know, seven, eight years ago, you know, probably I'm, I'm rolling about 150 right now weight. Uh, but I found myself, my highest recorded weight was probably 205. And then I quit weighing myself because it's going in the wrong direction. Why do I want to see that? Yeah. And um, yeah, it's kind of really was kind of in this, uh, you know, despair Doctors didn't necessarily want know what to do. I switched doctors and, you know, we got real lab work done and a one C came back as pre-diabetic and triglycerides were in the four hundreds. And she's having the conversation with me, uh, you know, about statins and metformin and it just left kind of, um, two emotions. One, it's depressing to face a, a health challenge. And then two, it's kind of, kind of angry in the sense that, you know, family history of type two diabetes I've watched how that progression has gone and, uh, you know, just went home and the next day kind of got, got fired up with curiosity in the sense of th there's gotta be something else I can do. Yeah. I, I'm in my early thirties. You know, this is, this is effectively, you know, what's called a untreatable disease and you have to manage it and you're going to live with it your whole life. And, you know, I just was, you know, resolved not to do that by any means necessary. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's like the, you get two miles to the finish line. What are you going to do? Uh, kind of, kind of attitude. And I think I was pretty lucky researching it back then in the sense that, uh, you know, keto was on the internet. There were a few podcasts or a couple blogs, but they're nothing like now. So wading through the information actually I felt was easier because there were, there was limited 
information. And, you know, one of the first things I came across was uh, the art and science of low carb performance, uh, you know, from doctors, Finney and Volick that helped found Verta ordered it on Amazon. I don't know if prime existed, but I got it within a day or two. And um, yeah, I literally just read it in one sitting and I'm kind of glad I got the performance book because it got me on the, the athlete side, the art and science of low carb living is obviously a great book, but to, I, Hey, that's my new gateway drug, right? Like mm-hmm. yeah, I'm reading this thing, I'm, I'm sitting here just having these epiphanies like, wow, if I just don't eat a lot of sugar and carbs, my glucose will come down and I'm probably going to lose weight. And like, no one has ever told me this, you know, and you know, now, now we, I guess people in, you know, like us and you know, people that are familiar with it, you know, it's not this radical concept, um, that it was, you know, so I just jumped in the deep end and coached myself, which honestly was quite a disaster. You know, the book seems very, it's very simple. Hey, don't eat carbs. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, like, could you, could you get any more simple, but there is some nuance to it. You know, especially I found, um, you know, like electrolyte balance. Yeah. You know, I think it's, that's, uh, you know, in the middle to the, to the near end of the book. And of course I read that chapter, but I didn't pay attention to it. Cause I, you know, I'm a genius and I just figured out, Hey, don't eat carbs and, and everything goes great. Um, yeah, but just jumped in and actually, uh, it, it was difficult. I'm not, I'm not ever going to lie that it was, it was easy. Um, I'm pretty stubborn though. And it's like, here's the plan. I'm following the plan. Anything on the plan that gets in my way, I'm just going to run over. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's just that athlete mentality, brick wall, run through it. Um, yeah, but there's definitely some art and skill, uh, that can be applied to it. And, you know, probably the, the big key that helped me dial it in was I met uh, Dr. Jim McCarter. He was here local in St. Louis. He was the first uh, head of research at Verda. And he did a presentation on his first year in ketosis uh, for a quantified self group that I was in. And we didn't know each other. And, you know, so of course I'm beelining to this. I get to meet another human in real life who's actually knows what this is and has done it. It's not a blog. It's not a Twitter person. It's not a podcast, like human face to face. And uh, it's kind of like, uh, you know, one of those instant, we see each other, we know we're doing it, we're going to now be best friends. <laughs> and uh, he was the first one to point out, he's like, how are you doing? And I'm like, well, I'm really struggling energy levels. And, you know, I'm trying to work out and I just don't have that push. And he's like, sodium, threw me some bouillon cubes. He's like, didn't you read chapter 20 or whatever it is in the book? And I'm like, well, of course I did. <laughs> but I wasn't doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and it was kind of night and day. And, uh, you know, obviously sodium and electrolytes and you just had Rob Wolf on, you know, I mean, if you, if you kind of been in the game, you realize that's a, that's a critical component. And, you know, so he helped me dial that part in and I probably lost, you know, that's probably the first 50 pounds in the first six months. Um, I can't say that I exercised in any formal sense or was training for anything, um, but definitely started going out and walking more. Um, uh, my gym had a sauna, started doing that, got through the first winter of kind of playing around with the cold thermogenesis stuff, you know, like, hey, I'm going to go for a walk. It's snowing today. I'm gonna go for a walk in the snow and a t-shirt and shorts on. <laughs> Just <laughs> kind of scratch that itch of pushing myself in competitiveness and that's it. And, um, and I really just kind of, I've stuck with it. You know, I'm in year seven now. And gone through little minor iterations, uh, you know, lowering carbs, increasing protein, you know, exercise, um, you know, both on the strength, strength training side. And, you know, now I'm back cycling pretty consistently. Um, and I don't know that they were, they certainly played a role. I'd say probably nutrition drove 80% of it. And also focusing on my sleep. I'd been diagnosed with sleep apnea. So getting that kind of taken care of and losing the weight had a huge factor. Um, yeah, that was funny. A couple of years ago, like when, when you and Sean started doing the show, that curiosity kicks in. Mm-hmm. This guy just eats steak, huh? Like, <laughs> huh? Wonder, I wonder what will happen, right? Um, you know, I wonder what will happen. So I just kind of dove into that and we already had a Costco membership. So that made it pretty easy, you know, to just swim over to the meat aisle. And I'm like, ah, three and four packs of ribeyes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I did about 30 days of just meat, ground beef and steak and realized, uh, 
I can do this, but this is uh, not a sustainable lifestyle change for me. So immediately swapped up and, you know, eggs, bacon, fish, chicken, sardines. And uh, yeah, really ran with that for a couple of years, um, which was interesting as I tore my ACL during that time. And so then my activity goes to zero, right? You know, it's mm-hmm. like, boom, and just continued eating that way probably cut back on the amount just a little bit and no weight gain, no blood sugar changes. Uh, ketones were fine, you know, no issues with it whatsoever. Um, uh, yeah. So that's, that's when we talked this year, cause, uh, got on Instagram and, you know, Amazon prime's great. If you want to watch a million documentaries of normal people doing crazy endurance events. So my, <laughs> wife, my wife's probably like going nuts. Like I just, like, oh, these people are running across the Sahara Desert. We're watching this and this guy riding his bike. You know, just stuff that we find normal, like regular people are just like, there's a level of insanity. And I totally, I get it. And I accept it now. I'm not even going to fight it. Um, but when I started cycling again, you know, that's when we talked. You know, I was really struggling eating enough food first and then where to strategically add carbohydrates in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so that, that really started and some of it, I think was a COVID response, right? Like cooped up in the house. I got to get out. I got to do something alone time. Just, I'm just going to jump back on the bike and, you know, and then really starting to scratch that itch again of, I should put some goals out there. Um, I'm aware of the downside of chasing goals and, you know, having an addictive personality in this sense, you know, I think a little bit after crashing and burning in the early 2000s, I was a little afraid of these goals. Like, oh, if I do another Ironman, you know, what will I ignore, right? It's just like, mm-hmm. it's so easy to uh, get out of balance to chase that. And not, now I'm 42, I'm not going to win anything, right? Like, you know, this is not my job. This is, you know, I'm not going to, you know, burn my family and quit my job and live in a trailer and you know, all these kind of things <laughs> chase, chase this kind of things. But it's kind of like adding that in. It's like, um, you know, it's exciting and there's ups and downs. And I think um, you, you might recognize this experience of there's a curiosity of what's out there past that outer range. And I've always found in, in long endurance sports, you can actually peel that onion to the center and kind of break down that ego self and come face to face with it through the ups and downs. And, you know, probably the only other place I've experienced that is on uh, meditation retreats. You could finally get the noise to stop. And there's almost, it, it sounds weird, right? You're in mile 99 and there's this, ah, mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's real you know, wherever that is in, in, in wherever someone is training. So, um, yeah, so that's what I've been doing. Just been a, been a little off week, got a little hamstring niggle. Um, but you know, just gonna kind of work through that and that's, that's stuff that comes along with this kind of stuff. So. Yeah, no doubt you get that repetitive motion and something is going to let you know it's there eventually. It seems, (laughs) um, yeah, well, that's, I didn't fix the ACL. So that adds another twist. Sure. I didn't have surgery. Uh, so yeah. So the hamstring, if you're off a little bit on your bike fit, that hamstring kicking in doing 90 RPMs, trying to stabilize the knee. If you have a little knee wobble in there, it's, uh, yeah. So that, that, that adds the the second twist to the challenges. Yeah. I'm older and, uh, well, I tore my Achilles. I have that surgically repaired and now I have no ACL. And it's like, I wonder if I can ride my bike, uh, you know, bike packing trip or, you know, 30 days, you know, with mm-hmm. no ACL. Yeah. <laughs> but let's make it even harder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is another challenge to add, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I might, uh, you know, I might end up find out that it's kind of uh, not a good idea and I'm going to end up in surgery and get it repaired, but we'll, we'll see how far this thing gets me without going under the knife. Yeah, it is interesting. It's always interesting to me how much that stuff's connected to. I know I always get reminded of that from time to time. I, a couple of years ago, I had just a little bit of discomfort underneath my knee. And I just thought I maybe had a little bit of patellar tendonitis because it's super common for runners. And I ultimately found out that it was just my hips were so tight that 
if I would go out for like, say a second workout of the day, it would take me like a mile or two to really kind of loosen up and then feel good. And until then, you know, that I'd have that pain underneath my knee. So once I figured out it was my, it was due to my tight hips though. Once I could get that loosened up before I would go out, then all of a sudden it was like, you know, no pain down there going forward for the, the entirety of the run. So it's like, Anytime there's pain somewhere is oftentimes something else that's causing that pain there. And it's not near that area. And, um, I always find that part of the sport kind of fast or that part of the human, human body actually kind of fascinating. Well, it's, uh, and I look at this as health coaching or coaching and you coach people is that, I mean, I think the, the keys are curiosity. We're almost detectives, Mm -hmm. right? We are investigating the crime scene you know, so it'd be easy to say, I have hamstring pain. Oh, I need to stretch my hamstring, but it, the body is so complex either, you know, the metabolism is extremely complex, but then the whole chain system of putting all these things together. And, you know, I think the, and I don't know, I don't know how much you work with outside people, but, you know, tomorrow chiropractor, I'm back in with my physical therapist, like people who think the same way, we're not going in and we're not icing the knee, right? The, mm-hmm. Where's the actual deficiency or tightness or whatever going on that we can resolve the root cause issue? You know, the same thing as metabolism, right? And you can band-aid these things forever or supplement them, but if you never get to the root cause of the issue and, um, you know, that, that's the one thing I forgot was, ah, massage therapist, uh, chiropractor, oh, this is, this is a uh, training time. Basically I have to rebuild in yeah. <laughs> my week, you know? So do you work with, I mean, do you just kind of go on an as needed basis or do you have uh, yeah, kind of- I'm, I'm not nearly as good as I probably should be, but what I, what I do uh, is I'll usually go and find like either a good chiropractor or a good massage therapist, good physical therapist that I feel really knows like, a lot about how everything's kind of connected and I'll just have them do kind of like a basic tune up. So depending on which, which professional is like, if it's a massage therapist, I'll just have them, you know, do like a good, like medium difficulty massage over like basically the entirety of my, you know, skeletal muscle system. Mm -hmm. And then they'll, at the end, they'll usually give you a pretty good assessment. Like, Oh, I noticed that, you know, your lats were tight, your calves were tight. And, you know, this area was a little more tight versus some of the other stuff. And then I usually can connect the dots there. Well, like, well, if that's tight, that's why I'm getting pressure here. Or if that's mm-hmm. tight, that's why I'm getting pressure there. And I just always make sure I ask questions and for like, like, uh, exercise and things to do to help remedy that from those folks too, after I get it. And then I kind of piece together like my at home routine. So then I'll have like, here are the four or five, like mobility or s- dynamic stretches or things that I got to be doing on a pretty daily basis if I want to make sure things are going to run smoothly for this training block. And, uh, you just kind of get to know it from that, I think. Um, but I think, you know, I'm just turned 35. So I'm kind of getting to that point now too, where, you know, know, the majority of my running career, I could probably just ignore a lot of stuff and not necessarily have it come back and bite me too badly. Um, but you know, you, I'll, I'll, I'll probably need to just be a little more on top of that stuff from a, just a, a routine basis versus a, let's do this, a few times here and there, uh, to make sure everything is okay. Uh, just to stay on top of it. I think that's probably my next step. Is that, uh, daily routine maintenance that, that trips us all up. It's funny though. Cause like when I think back to like being in high school and even earlier than that, when you first get into sports, it's like, I can think of maybe one or two times I was actually sore. Like, 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 and it wasn't because I wasn't doing a lot. I mean, there was like summer days where I was out on my bike the entire day and, mm-hmm. and, you know, running around playing, playing football, baseball, or whatever happened to be the sport of choice at the time. And, you know, you would think you would just be sore all the time doing that. Like if I went and did my routine when I was in middle school on one weekend day, even with all the running fitness I have, I'd probably be super sore the next day. <laughs> so yeah. it's yeah. funny how that just kind of like gradually catches up with you as you get older and probably less active on a routine basis in a lot of cases too, or at least less well-roundedly active. I mean, I'm incredibly active person, but it's all fairly centered around ultra marathon running. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Those, those, those side to side motion sports don't do me a whole lot of uh, favors these days. (laughs) Nah, you know, it's so funny. And this, I remember, you know, so I was in high school in the nineties and yeah, I had that same experience you know, and we, especially in track. I mean, we trained mm-hmm. hard track, 
sprint training has evolved quite a bit. It used to be just run everybody into the ground and whoever's left, you know, and there's been a big evolution, um, partially led by one of the guys I coach with at Parkway Central. Um, but there's, there's a lot of, a lot of different training going on now, but you know, I don't, I don't remember ever being sore and it's funny coaching a volunteer and I, I work at the high school still and you, know, you get a freshman that comes in coach. I think I tore my quad. I'm like, you don't even have quads yet. <laughs> like, I was your age. We trained wrongly 50 times harder. Yeah. We came back the next day. Like, I think you'd be okay, but I think they see, and it, it's good that kids are exposed. You know, you have the internet and pro athletes and they see all the recovery modalities and the physical therapy. And I'm like, you're not 30 yet. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. Hey, let's just get moving. And I think you're going to be okay. Um, and that's it. So it's, it's fun, uh, you know, going through that, but yeah, you just gotta, you gotta put all the pieces together. And I guess that's the one thing like, man, everything just keeps changing. <laughs> so mm-hmm. It's just like, yeah. Just- yeah. You just get more and more information about what exact, I guess you can kind of narrow that channel down to like, what is going to produce your optimal performance. And you find out like, oh, there's really no reason to go drastically outside this channel on the aggressive side uh, or, you know, the underperformance side. And then you kind of just have a little bit better of a, of a roadmap, I think, in a lot of cases. And um, that's one of the things I actually kind of like about ultra marathoning still is it's very undiscovered in the sense that there's just not been historically a lot of money sunk into the research behind it. And uh, I mean, it sounds like that'd be a frustrating thing, right? Because I, most people probably want a real clean, like directive, but I like the kind of uncertainty of that, that kind of almost wild, wild west where it's, uh, you know, this, this should be how this works on paper, but we really don't know because at the end of the day, you're running a hundred miles and the research kind of ends at 26.2 for the most part. <laughs> and, and you get to the point where like, you know, ultimately you are leaning on a lot of anecdotes, the small amount of research that has been done, things that you can fairly extrapolate forward. I think there's some things you can, but then I think there's also the side of it where, you know, people want to maybe stake a sense of authority within the sport to a degree. And that puts them in a position to feel like they have to say, well, this is the way to do it. And it's like, well, I don't know that we know that yet. <laughs> so, And then, you know, I, I could go on forever about this, but then you get the whole psychological component of running all day. It's like, sometimes it's not always what would make most sense from a physical development standpoint. That's going to get you the strongest mentally at say mile 80 of a hundred mile race and feeling like you're able to push in when like your mind and body are both kind of telling, you no. So it's a, uh, it's an interesting topic. Yeah. I mean, I think that mental part, you know, the longest I've done is a marathon running, you know, the, the bike was always kind of the, the one that, that got me the most, but it is that, you know, how do you respond? I always saw event day is almost was like a microcosm for life, right? You know, you get up early and you're super excited, or at least I was, you probably have anxiety and fear, no matter how well prepared you feel you are. And just that the gun goes off and it doesn't matter the distance. There's always a few people who treat it like a hundred meter sprint. And uh, that was me for a long time. Like, yeah, let's start this marathon, you know, uh, with a mile pace, I can't run, uh, you know, plus <laughs> sustain. and then, uh, you know, you kind of cruising along and, you know, at some point it just hits you. I mean, I've never had a clean race of any distance. Um, I don't know if that, that exists. I'm sure it does, but when you get out to ultra, marathon or endurance i mean just you're going to hit it and you don't know when it's going to hit you and just that that psychological battling through um and i think when i was younger it really was that just kind of you know there was almost like a an anger and a hate to it i don't know if that makes sense it's just like this this force and pressure to drive this thing out and as i've gotten older it's you know probably just from getting older and i think meditation has been pretty helpful of this kind of settling in and accepting of it and being okay with it and processing it, which which probably sounds weird to a lot of people. You know, if you're moving at a certain pace, like, you know, there's this little Zen thing going on in your head, but the more you can accept it and work through those valleys and and realize there's a peak coming and then there, there might be another Valley and then you're going to get through that. And, um, 
I mean, that's the part I think now that really, really intrigues me the most about getting back out there is just that, that work with the mind. Um, and then realizing, I don't know how much longer my body can do it. So, you know, it's just, that's, uh, yeah, that's fun. All right, folks, this episode of HPO Podcast is brought to you by Bioptimizers P3OM. P3OM are probiotics that improve your digestion and nutrient absorption, helping ensure your digestive tract and immune system stay strong and healthy. While many other probiotics on the market don't even survive your own stomach acid, P3OM is fully tested to make sure that probiotic strains not only survive in your body, but also don't compete with each other. So you're as protected as possible from the growth of bad bacteria and other pathogens. While other probiotics require refrigeration and often die in transport and on the shelf, P3OM doesn't need refrigeration at all. So if you're ready to check them out, head over to bioptimizers.com forward slash human. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S dot com forward slash human. And by using promo code HUMAN10, that's H-U-M-A-N-1-0, you'll also get 10% off your next order. So two things to remember, bioptimizers.com forward slash human and promo code HUMAN10. All right, folks, now back to the show. I wouldn't, um, cause you focus mostly track road, you know, when it did, was it Jim Walmsley who just tried to go? Yeah. Yeah. Is that a hundred kilometers? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That was an interesting event that was, I had a lot of fun watching it. It was, uh, um, but yeah, to answer your question, I focus on more runnable stuff. Like I don't stay away from the trails, but I do prefer not having to spend like say a quarter or more of the race hiking. <laughs> so I tend to find the courses that allow me to do that if I can. But um, it, yeah, G- you know, Jim is an interesting guy in general because for, especially for someone like myself who I've really fine tuned a fairly like specific event where it's like, I really like the hundred mile distance. I really like runnable hundred milers. So I've spent a huge portion of my career just really fine tuning my ability to minimize the mistakes and getting efficient within that. And, and Jim definitely hyper focuses on certain things, but he's so good and so like kind of committed to whatever it is he's got his eye on that he's been able to do very well on, you know, essentially courses like the Western States 100, which is a runnable hundred miler mm-hmm. by a lot of trail mountain standards. But it's, I mean, you go through four major canyons where there's a mile in there where you're climbing over a thousand feet for a single mile. So it's definitely not a track flat by any stretch. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he's perfected that course twice. He's got the two fastest or the fastest and the second, third fastest time on that course. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he, you know, comes down and prepares for this hundred kilometer race this last weekend uh, and runs the second fastest time in the history of the world at that. And, And the thing that makes it that even more impressive for him on that, in my opinion, is the world record for the hundred K was done on this course that had like just a perfect setup where they ended up with like a, like seven, I think if I remember it was like 70% of it was a tailwind. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, it's technically certified, but it's like, it's a little like, you're never going to have a condition quite that good again without it being non-certifiable. So Mm -hmm. they caught a pretty good window, I think, as far as you can tell, for that. So Jim had definitely a big order to go after. And for folks who didn't pay attention to that, it's, it's on YouTube. And I would recommend everyone watch the last like 20 minutes of that from Jim finishing. So he finished in six hours, nine minutes, which is a five minute, 57 second per mile pace for 62 and a half miles. And he missed the world record by like 11 seconds. It's like 11 to 12 seconds. So he got to the, the course was set up a seven loop, um, set up. So, uh, you know, he had to, he, he had to basically kind of pace himself perfectly. And he was just like a minute or two ahead of world record pace, basically all day. So he was pacing it perfectly. And I think he came into the last 10 K maybe with a minute and like 15 seconds or something like that. ahead of world record pace and just could was, he was like the cool thing about this experience. since it was essentially like set up to be fairly low, key, not, not low key in the sense that they didn't want media attention. They want a ton of media attention around it, but obviously you can't do like really big, like Boston marathon style road races right now. So it was just like, you know, 
probably 30 athletes total kind of in a bubble for a week or so before. And they just had this, this loop measured out and they all had them race on that day, that morning, and they covered it live. And yeah, just following like the, the lead car, they tune into the lead car with the video and the audio. And you could just hear Jim, like basically yelling at himself. Like you could tell his mind wanted to break, his mind was going to break that record that day. But like he was, you could see him, he was almost like trying to rally his legs because you get to those runnable fifth or runnable ultra marathons where it's all concrete or all track. It's like, this is a perfect scenario for a fast time, right? Like everything is out of the way. The obstacles are all cleared. It's just forward movement at its finest, but that absolute monotonous, repetitive, hard pounding, just uniform mechanic hour after hour after hour just really beats up certain parts of your body at an accelerated rate compared to what it does on like these very terrain trails Hmm. that I think sometimes when guys come down off the mountains and do a road race of that length for the first time, uh, it's a little bit of an eye opener to them because their quads go and then they're just like, it's like, there's nothing you then no force of will can get them to move. So you're just like, kind of, it's a frustrating experience that you kind of have to get in your head before you kind of fine tune it. And then you, you know, you start doing specificity stuff and learning it and figuring out how to avoid it and pacing properly. And these guys can all figure it out if they decide to do it, but it's just such a fun thing to watch because you just never know who's going to crack and then who's going to like have a race like Jim did. And then even with the race Jim had, he still missed the world record by 12 seconds. So he was uh, obviously a little gutted for that. I'm sure, you know, you spent six hours and nine minutes going to hell and back. And then you're 12 seconds shy of the goal you're trying to get. It's got to be a little, a little disheartening too, but yeah, you got me on my soapbox now with that. Right. <laughs> and it's fresh in my mind. Cause it was just this last Saturday. Well, the, yeah, I saw, well, I mean, he cut himself. So I, I just yeah. like, I saw it online and he's bleeding all over himself. And I'm like, Oh, this is amazing. This is exactly what I want to watch right now. Right. You know, yeah. I, I saw somebody posted his splits and they were per kilometer. So that always messes me up, you know, not mm-hmm. being, you know, being from America, we're like per mile. Yeah, you give know? us the mile split. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, you see these, you see these kilometer splits, and I'm like, it is, he is literally a metronome. Mm-hmm. And, he, and I'm sure he's looking back, and it's like, oh, it was, it was one second there, one second there, one second there. And, you know, you get that close, and it's in your head. It's like that one turn, that one curve, that one water break where I slowed down for half a second and you start dicing and it can it can kind of drive you nuts and yeah I kind of get that I like that actually like one of the main gravel trails that I train on I mean it is it's not pancake flat but it's flat and you get a little bit of varied terrain but you know after four or five hours you're effectively in the same position outside of you know moving a little bit and it's almost kind of like that tunnel vision sets in and it's literally just pedal crank pedal crank pedal crank you know head down you know kind of kind of experience and um it's almost sometimes i mean well I, well you know hey a lot of times it sucks right <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know but there there are those like just kind of glimpses in there it's almost like uh without getting too mystically it's kind of like these little transcendental experiences and then there's uh there's certainly miles where you, you almost wake up and you're like, I don't remember the last three miles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's just amazing. You know? Yeah. You just zone out or zone in. However you look at it. It's interesting. Well, I mean, it's like you said earlier, like some of these long efforts or these like race day type things, they are kind of like, um, you know, life experience condensed down into one day. And there was actually a documentary based on that premise by this guy, Billy Yang. He did it on a, of I think four women who were running Western States. I can't remember what year it was. It was maybe 2017 event or something like that. And he titled it uh, life in a day. And it was like, perfect. It's like, yeah, a hundred mile race is exactly that. It's like, it's like you said, you wake up, you're excited, you're anxious, you're nervous, you got everything ahead of you. And then like, you know, you go through that entire process. And even if you just absolutely nail it, there are points in that race where you, you ebbed and flow. You had lows, you had highs, you were, you had doubts, you were confident and you just went back and forth between that. So many times, by the time you get to the finish line, you, you, you cross the line and you, you feel like you lived a full life just in that, that condensed time frame. So it is, I think that is kind of a draw for some of that stuff. And uh, I mean, you certainly highlighted a lot of cool things we could kind of channel towards for the, for this interview with your, with just your background too. And I think like, 
some of that is like also tied into like the addictive personalities that tend to kind of find themselves doing events like that. Um, you know, and they could, you, they could always like have focused that energy in a different path. That's less productive. And I think you can make the argument running a hundred miles is an ex- well, it's definitely an extreme, but like an extreme that potentially like finds that margin of diminishing return on the health <laughs> side of things <laughs> but at the same time you know it, it 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 beats the heck out of you know like becoming an alcoholic or addicted to a drug that's gonna slowly kill you or quickly kill you in some cases so uh it, it's it's an interesting kind of personality type i think at the end of the day yeah i kind of look at it as uh choosing choosing my suffering voluntarily yeah right this time um, and, and, you know, you could say, Hey, yeah, I voluntarily drank or, or took those drugs, but there's certainly a certain point, you know, there's a lot of people who drink alcohol and even, you know, use, use addictive narcotics and drugs and stuff that don't become quote addicts. Right. You know, there's, it's really a, I always kind of look at it as like a biopsychosocial condition, right? Yeah. You need the biology and maybe we're wired a certain way. Uh, you need some psychological thing going on that probably interplays in there. And then you have your social environment and it's the same thing with food, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you get, and it's, uh, I think it's always funny. And, you know, there's kind of the meme out there like, Oh, you know, sugar's like cocaine. And I'm like, well, I've done cocaine. And I'm going to tell you like, (laughs) sugar is not like cocaine. (laughs) It's like, like, uh, yeah, I'm not calling my, my donut dealer up at 2 a.m. You know, it's yeah. like, you know kind of thing. It's but just way more available, I think, is part of it. It's like, I mean, I think if someone really wants to get their hands on cocaine, they probably can. But you you do have to take some steps. Whereas, like, you know, if I want to go buy a mega gulp, I walk a half a block down the road and, and I have one in, in like a couple minutes. So, <laughs> yeah, I was, it, you know, I, it's funny because, um, you know, when I when I was going through recovery for all those things, like, I you know, I turned to food. You know, you go to any AA meeting, you're going to find donuts, coffee, and cigarettes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so coffee, great. You know, I wasn't going to pick up smoking all of a sudden now. <laughs> you know, that yeah. wasn't great. But yeah, there was definitely a time where, yeah, comfort foods and sugar and all those things. And, you know, I started to kind of slowly notice that, you know, I ate the same way that I drank. You know, this whole concept of moderation with food. And, you know, and a lot of people can moderate food. Um, but for me, it was like, Oh, one. And I, I still challenged a little bit with it. You know, we had Thanksgiving and it's like, I'm going to have, I got my days I go off. You know, I don't call them cheat meals. I just don't like the whole concept behind that. You know, I call them relief valves. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to get through a year perfect, but I'm going to plan my imperfection because I want to be perfect at it. So if I make this quote imperfect plan and I follow through, then, you know, I still get an A plus, right? <laughs> like I still mm-hmm. did what I was planning on doing. You know, you need to have the one piece of pie and it's like, well, is anybody going to eat that other one over there? Yeah. It, it starts going. It, it's funny. It tastes good. And, and that's what I work with people with a lot is, uh, you know, just the way our brains work. It's kind of funny. Mm-hmm. You know, can we make it lighthearted? Yes. These are all, you know, serious topics. Yeah. No, but we can we just kind of have, have some fun with it. Yeah. And I think like what you said there with like the release valve thing, I think it just makes sense. Cause you look at anything else that has an upward trajectory, it's never like an exact grade the entire time up. Like it's not like a 15% grade continuously over X amount of time that gets you to the goal. It's always like a little up, little down, a little more up, a little more down. And you get kind of like a, an ascending stock chart essentially. <laughs> and uh, I think like, I mean, that's how performance works. That's how training works. Like I might have a great workout and then, have a bad workout. And then two weeks later, realize the gains from both those workouts and be a little bit faster. And it didn't look as clean on paper as maybe we would have liked it when we were planning things out, but it ends up getting you to where you want to be. And I think like the the fact that we look at nutrition or weight loss or diet in general, in a way that's different than that, or that's hard to come hard to compartmentalize the same way is a little bit intriguing to me because I think we, you almost need to have like this idea or this understanding that it's not going to be a perfect, like perfect upswing at at the exact grade the entire way. And if you know that, then I think like, depending on how structured you want to get, like you can have a scenario like you do where you're like, okay, well maybe once a week or once every two weeks or however often it ends up working out for your programming. I'm going to have a day where I just like, kind of like release the tension a little bit 
uh, give myself uh, the way I like to look at it too, is like give myself a short term goal to get to. So I don't feel like I'm trying to like get that initial excitement to last like four months or six months or something like that, or however long it's going to take to get to your goal. And it's when you kind of structure things like that, that I think you can kind of like tap into that, that momentum and that, that motivation for a long period of time versus having it like kind of fade out after the first, like, you know, three, four weeks, and then you end up worse off than you were when you started kind of like new year's resolution style. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, it's great. Well, even with training, like the evolution of training metrics, right. There's so many more metrics, especially like on the bike, but definitely running and heart rate and HRV and lactate and via like, there's there's so many numbers out there that can be amazing, Mm -hmm. you know, even in the last 20 years. And then you look on like the nutrition side, right obviously you can, you can count macros and, you know, blood glucose and ketones and weight, and you can get the scales that do your body fat percentage. And now you've got CGMs and you've got the biosense and we got, we got all this stuff coming in and all these numbers. And it is that you put them on a chart and you want them to go up incrementally perfect. And anytime it deviates, it's like, and I go through the same thing, right? It's like, you know, we want to use these as a guide take them seriously. What can we learn from them? But how do we keep our, I always say like, how do you keep yourself in the middle of the boat when the number isn't what you want? Mm -hmm. Because to me, it's always that, that initial mental reaction and the story I tell myself about the numbers that is way more damaging than number, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, outside of the sense, you know, if you have a true medical emergency, obviously the number is needs to get taken care of, but you know, if it's a training metric or a health metric, you know, I've always found that my reaction to the number is my problem, mm-hmm. not the number. You know, the number's just data. And really, it's past data. You know, even if you collect it in the moment, it's about what you did, but you don't know um, what that's going to be in the future. And I, I don't think I noticed that. Probably the, the eye opener was uh, when I got into strength training, I didn't have a background. I mean, outside of just lifting and, um, so trying new things, I'm like, I want to learn this Olympic weightlifting stuff, you know, so go down to a gym and extremely difficult new skill to learn when you're older, <laughs> you know, so, and, um, you know, I, I tweaked something and I took two weeks off and then I came back in the gym and lifted a PR, right? It's mm-hmm. just all that training stimulus of three months and then taking two weeks, not totally off, but effectively off and not doing it was what my brain and body needed to produce this, this PR performance later. And I had no expectation. I'm like, I'm just going to go in and see what I'm going to do today. You know, and it's like, holy cow. You know, it's like, I would never have thought that um, ever. And it's, it's always, I don't know if it's a cliche, but it always seems like the breakthroughs come as you're climbing out of the valley kind of concept. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just not this steady progressive linear and i think our brains like that right there's certainty i can put the next plot on the chart where the graph should go and then we feel good and Mm -hmm. then it doesn't we feel bad and then it's just you know how do we adapt and adjust and certainly learn from those things Mm -hmm. and realize they change yeah yeah from what i can gather it seems to be like as humans for whatever reason we really get a lot of momentum from the kind of continuous like feedback loop of things going right. So like, if you're like, like if I were to say trying to lose 10 pounds and I lost one pound every week on the dot for 10 weeks straight, you know, that would be all I would need to stay motivated with whatever I was doing to get to that point. Uh, Because every week I'd step on the scale and be like, success, you did it. Check box, box, hundred percent, a plus, you know, whatever you want to call it. And then that's enough motivation to do it for seven more days and then kind of keep going and keep going. And then you, you get to these scenarios like we described where it doesn't quite work like that. Maybe after week one, you gain a pound, but then maybe after week two, you've lost three. And then it kind of, you know, you end up in this, this, uh, this spot where you kind of have to be like a little more trustful of the process or you have to buy in enough to stay committed to it, even when it maybe looks like it's going backwards. And this is kind of the topic I wanted to talk to you the most about, I think, Doug, is just like this idea of when we have a scenario like that, how important is it to essentially have a team around you? 
because like, I think Verta, this is the first thing I noticed about Verta when you guys started kind of pumping out results and starting to see like, okay, this is what we're seeing with our, with our, with our patients. And the first thing that popped into my, or that showed up on my radar was that your success rate was just so much higher than what I would see, like in a typical kind of just ketogenic, uh, nutrition or low carb nutrition framework when someone's just kind of left with, uh, the internet and their best effort, (laughs) I guess is the way to put it. And I mean, that's not unique to the ketogenic diet, the low carb diet, the Atkins diet, you know, any of these diets, vegan, you know, like the standard American diet for, for what it's worth, you know, it's, uh, these things all have incredibly low success points and I can't help but think that's kind of two f- kind of maybe like two different things to look at with that. One is I think anytime you tell someone there's one way to do something, you're going to have massive failure because there's going to be people along the way that, that, that one way actually doesn't work for, and you know, they're going to obviously fail. And, uh, then you have this like self-defeating kind of attitude about it when things aren't going well, cause you get frustrated. You're like, well, this is the only way and it's not working for me. Where do I go? And so that's part of it. So I always think like options are great. If we have like really, really good information and people to help someone with a vegan diet, great with a ketogenic diet. Great. The carnivore diet. Great with the paleo diet. Great. Standard American diet. Great but they're going to kind of need to know, like, I have different options that I can find which one of these pathways forward is going to be the most sustainable for me as an individual, meaning I can adhere to it essentially for the rest of my life. Um, versus I could do this for six months, meet my goal, but then end up right back where I started in two more years and then have to ask yourself why you did it in the first place. And the other side to that, is just the, the, the camaraderie, I think, or the verification from someone that you consider a professional or someone who's done this before knows the ins and out knows the pitfalls can coach you through the process when things are bleak. So the way I look at it is if you take that same example of, I'm going to try to lose 10 pounds in 10 weeks and I get to week three and I'm half a pound off my goal but I know I'm doing everything right on paper and I have someone who's a professional there watching this with me and they can say, Hey, just stay the course. You're going to probably see an improved amount of gain above and beyond what we expect in one week down the road. And just sometimes having that person there to kind of say like, I see that I've seen this happen a thousand times. It'll happen with you too. You just got to stay the course. I think that's such a powerful thing to have. And it seems that's kind of like what Verta's done. They've leveraged online Um, connectivity with people who are interested in using a low carbohydrate diet to manage their type two diabetes. And obviously that comes in the presence of nutrition information, but it also, you know, when we're talking about health and we're certainly about type two diabetes, like, you know, exercise plays a big role in that too. So like, you know, coaching can be something that people maybe would need, especially if they don't have a history of working out. When I look at your story, Doug, it's like, I find it really interesting because when you finally got to the point where you're like, I have a problem that I need to fix. You had a huge background in sport to say, well, this is where I'm going to channel this energy. Now you take someone who never had that before. Like, sure. They could maybe like read an article online and get motives at all. I'm going to train for a marathon or I'm going to start, you know, going to the gym, but they have zero background. So if they don't have a coach in that situation, they're going to have a hard time implementing. Yeah. And I think it's, um, yeah, probably. I mean, obviously we focus on nutrition. Um, but I think a lot of it, you know, there's all these pieces to the puzzle and there's so many different ways somebody can structure their life and what they need. And, you know, so all of, all of the coaches we've got, I mean, you know, if, if sleep is the issue, let's talk about sleep, right? You know, obviously if you, if you fix your sleep and you sleep better, you're going to have health benefits, right? If we're more physically active, well, what does that look like for you? I think a lot of a lot of times it's, what do you actually like to do? And I've seen that in myself. You know, when I, when I had all that weight on, I like to run. I don't like to run at prop 215 pounds at five, seven, mm-hmm. like this sounded completely miserable to me, but as, as the weight came off, so it was like, okay, well, as the weight comes off, now I'm going to re-engage with these things. But yeah, I think having, having a background, you know, it was kind of like, I, I knew at this point it was like nutrition has got to be the key. And I, th- I think if I, well, obviously I wasn't motivated enough by the weight gain 
<laughs> to work out. I think it was really having like that kind of that medical diagnosis side of it that kind of made me realize that, hey, what I'm not eating the right way. Um, and exercise isn't necessarily maybe going to solve that, although it's a great add on kind of concept there. Yeah. So it is, I think it is, it's just that having that experience of, of, of walking people through the process. And I think a lot of what, what we try to do is also, you know, they're not bulldozing the path for them, but, you know, bringing up here's, here's probably a, some reasonable things that you're going to experience. Um, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know what it's going to be, but we can use these big buckets, you know, and I would just call it life happens. You know, you're going to have a relationship stress. You're going to have a work stress. You might have a financial stress. You might have a loss of a loved one stress. You might just have this, forget it. I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> right. Like, and these are all completely normal parts of the path. Like no one gets through perfect. Um, and that's probably the challenging thing with social media is that it's everyone's highlight reel, mm -hmm. right? You, you just see like just fantastic stories and we have our own community internally that patients can interact with each other. And, um, and again, it's great to celebrate wins. Um, but a lot of times I think what we're lacking is the, the honest uh, struggle stories, you know? So I, I just try to bring that to patients like, Hey, look, I've done this. And I'll tell you the story about when I ate a whole pecan pie and just binged. And I'm going to tell you the story when I threw my scale in the trash can and had to fish it out later. Cause I was mad that I gained two pounds. Like these are all just completely normal experiences and human reactions. And it's okay. You know, you're not, you're not the weird one. You're certainly not alone um, where you might feel alone. And I think, um, if people have friends and family that are doing it with them, then they've got that in-person community. Right. And I think, um, you know, if your husband or wife or your kids or your aunts or your uncles or your best friend or all your coworkers at work are doing it, it's going to be easier. Right. You know, like if you're in a running group and everybody meets at 5.00 AM, the chances of you showing up at 5.00 AM are a lot better than if you're doing it by yourself. Right. Um, you know, so we're always trying to help people build those communities, but it, it's still kind of new. You know, I mean, I, I think we think, like, I think everybody knows about low carbon ketogenic diet, right? I mean, this little bubble of Verta, we interact, like you know, everybody knows what I do, all these kind of things. And then, um, you know, but a lot of people might not have that support system. And then, you know, for all intents and purposes, especially at the beginning, you know, that's going to be me. And it's that, that communication and listening to the stories and just connecting, um, you know, telling my stories, I always feel as a form of empathy, like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to show myself, be vulnerable, tell you all the mistakes I made, you know, and realize, you know, I'm not this superhuman genius, amazing discipline person, you know, like I've, I've done all these things. And, and what, I think we share, I don't know. We, I've always just noticed like humans and I think we connect more with our shared suffering than our wins. Like I'm, I'm always high-fiving people and I like to see people do great things. Um, but it's when we're struggling together and sharing and connecting. I think that's where those real, real bonds show up, right? Whether it's friendship or family or, you know, coaching, um, you know, even with, with high school kids, I'll do the same thing. You know, they have a bad race or we have a bad soccer game or something. And the kids probably get the eye roll going like, here's another old man speech, you know, but I'm trying to be, it's not this glory days speech. Usually it's this, Hey, when I was your age, here's all the mistakes I've made, mm -hmm. you know, can you try to learn from me? Um, yes, yeah, so I think the relationship is, you know, obviously the information's key. Um, but I think it's their relationship and really helping them through the ups and downs and just bringing some perspective. And, and I always try to bring, at least kind of a lighthearted approach. I mean, that's my personality. It's like, you know, when, especially when we get into health and medical issues, I mean, these are obviously very serious topics and they can be very scary for people. Um, you know, but can we have just a real open, honest human communication and, and it's okay to laugh. I mean, that's probably the one thing I got out of AA and hopefully you never have to go, but if you go to an AA meeting, you're just as likely to see people laughing as you are crying and just being in that environment now for 20 years of 
um, hey, hey, it's okay. And, you know, we don't have to take this all as life and death serious. Um, Cause it, it weighs, right. It's just like, it gets real depressing, right. It's just, it's like, okay, hey, let's, let's, let's bring that back a little bit and it's okay to have a little bit of fun and it's okay to laugh at ourselves and it's okay to be human. Um, so I like to bring that through. And I think, um, I think it's helpful. I mean, you know, it's just, it's real life though. Right. Mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it's not all unicorns and rainbows and, and that's okay. And, uh, but things can still get better and, and we can still take action. And, and ultimately that's it. It's like, you know, just, just like running. It's, sometimes it's just like one foot in front of the next. It, can I make the next mile marker? That's mm-hmm. literally it. It's just, it's a survival game and you push through and, and things can get better. So that's, that's a lot of like, I think, uh, you know, what our coaches bring is just that human connection, human quality um, to, to a program that we think works pretty good. Um, and I think probably the one, the one thing on the nutrition side that has always been a pet peeve of mine is you know, I've just, there is no ketogenic diet. Right. <laughs> you know, it is like, if there's like any, like one speech I like to give, it's like, there is no such thing as a ketogenic diet. You know, like ketosis is a biological process and there is what, whatever one person eats that kind of turns that up to whatever we kind of say that metric of ketosis is mm-hmm. that's it. And, you know, for you, I mean, you've been sharing your bio sense. I mean, what, what's a, a normal day? You're 150 grams of carbs. Yeah, it can range. I probably average between hundred, 150 grams per day mm-hmm. over the course of a year. And that's going to include like, you know, the odd in scenarios where I'm super low, close to zero during like off season or post race recovery type scenarios, as well as some days where, you know, I'm doing back to back 30 milers and I may hit 200 plus grams, mm-hmm. uh, for days like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, I'm going to do some more of that. I, I, I did like a few weeks of just kind of like training log stuff on, on the Patreon page where I was putting like everything I trained, everything I ate, my biosense readings, which is just your, your breath acetone reading to give you a look at kind of what level of ketosis you're in as well as CJM data. So it's just like really kind of interesting to see like the different patterns that you get from like a lifestyle that, that, that I have anyway. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, from like from a ketosis, you're, you're, you're so spot on because it's, it's like, I could be at 1.0 millimoles. Cause people are probably going to reflect on that a little more than the, the acetone scores mm-hmm. and be like what people would consider in at least a low to moderate amount of ketosis. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I could be there from doing very little running and essentially eating a fairly strict ketogenic diet of 30 to 50 grams per day. Or I could be there because I ate 150 grams of carbohydrates, carbohydrates that day, but banged out a 20 minute run at my aerobic threshold or something like that. So it's like, there's different ways to get to that specific ketone score. Mm -hmm. So it's like you said, I think it's less about having the exact diet as much as it is understanding your lifestyle and what is going to feed into the impact of the certain macronutrient ratios or grams or percentages, however you want to look at it, that are going to uh, end up kind of getting you to that, that spot you want to be, or that spot that you find the most optimal. And uh, one thing that Dr. Dominic D'Agostino said, mentioned to me and the, the folks at levels and also the guys at uh, Biosense told me too, is like, don't get hung up on saying, Oh, I want to average, you know, 85 uh, milligrams per deciliter on my blood, blood sugar score per day. And I want to, you know, average 11 ACEs on your biosense meter every day. It's like, look at the patterns and tease out when you feel great and when you perform the best and start to develop like a personal signature. And then when you notice like, oh, when I don't sleep well, this is what happens on my CGM meter. And this is what happens on my, my biosense meter. And this is how my workouts feel. Or when I sleep great for like two or three consecutive days and strategize my workouts to fall in this particular order and my eating patterns, this particular way, that's when I feel the best. You start to kind of develop an individualized plan that is 
becomes it sounds con- like kind of complicated when you hear us talking about biosense meters and CGMs and things like that. But ultimately, with anything I've ever done with nutrition and this type of stuff included, is you use those tools in a little bit of an obsessive compulsive way for a while as you kind of learn the routine. But once you learn the routine that works for you, then it just comes super intuitive and you just kind of do it without even thinking about it. And, you know, you, you notice more when you deviate from it than when you're sticking to it. So it's a, it it gets kind of a, a little more bearable, I think at that point. Hey folks, I want to make a quick shout out to some of my personal athlete sponsors and offer all of you some discount options if you think my gear is also right for you. My shoe of choice, Ultra Footwear, is offering listeners 15% off. They make a foot-shaped, balanced, cushioned shoe that fits like a glove. S-Fuels is offering 5% off and they are my go-to low-carb workout and lifestyle product of choice. Egg Weights is offering 15% off their running form, strength work, and recovery products. Finally, Purpose Performance Wear is offering 10% off my favorite workout apparel, including my own signature series. So head over to zachbitter.com forward slash my gear or the profile link on my social media channels to check out these discounts and more. All right, folks, now back to the show. Yeah, that's my. I've got all these things laying around the house. My wife's like, "What are you going to stop using that thing?" I'm like, "Still figuring it out. Still figuring it out." And probably like the best analogy someone gave me was like, you know, if you're going on a road trip, you know, you use a map, right? Of course, now we have map app, but so like back in the day, you had a map, right? So you get to your destination. Like, do you keep reading your map? You're already there, right? It's just like go on your vacation or do your event. Like you don't carry the map around with you. Let, let me double check to see that I actually did take the right way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, so these are, you know, you, you know, these are the the milestones and the markers and they kind of tell you, you know, are you, are you going in a, the general direction you want and feedback, but I, I, I still see that, you know, it's just my competitive brain is like, what's my glucose, you know, and it's been interesting using that on the bike in the sense of, you know, my goal is not, a glucose number or a ketone number. My goal is a performance outcome measure, you know, mm-hmm. could be speed or Watts per kilo or minute per mile. Like, okay. So where do I perform the best? And then what are those numbers when I'm performing my best? Okay. Maybe now I can kind of optimize a little. And I think I've learned some stuff on, you know, certainly on the, on the CGM side more, you know, it's like if my blood glucose goes under 80, it's not a bonk. I mean, I've certainly had back in the day at high carb bonk, getting off the bike, taking a nap on the side of the road bonk. <laughs> but, you know, and that's what, that's what we talked about was like, and, you know, that's why, I, that's why I called you because I'm like, I know I need to add more carbs. I have this cognitive dissonance going on in my head about doing it. Like I just needed someone else to tell me add carbs even though I knew that was the answer, right? It's just like those hills that I think, you know, anybody that, anybody that we're working with about anything, we all have our biases or kind of ruts we get stuck in. And, you know, I certainly have that, you know, it's like dogmatic, you know, I get dogmatic with myself. Like, oh, I can, oh, if I add 20 grams of carbs, it's like, this is not the end of the world here, you know, and mm-hmm. so we're adding it, you know, I'm going to add, you know, I've kind of found that sweet spot. It's like 30 grams of carbs per hour. And yeah. You know, it's interesting because what you just kind of described to me is actually kind of shaped the way I try to like explain what I do now over the last few years differently than maybe I would have originally. And some of that's just kind of learning, I think, what is going to be the most helpful for people um, in terms of just like what I share about what I do and what would maybe be something worth considering for them and their lifestyle is like after doing just like hundreds of these consultations, you start to get an idea of like, what do people actually want to know? Like, what are they actually looking for? And, you know, a lot of times they, uh, they do know the answer or they have a good idea. They're heading in the right direction, but they just need a little bit of rearranging of the puzzle pieces. Or like you said, they need someone who they believe has already gone through that process multiple times to tell them, oh yeah, this is right. Or don't be afraid to do that. And it just kind of qualms that fear or that anxiety around that area that was previously causing that. So like when, when I talk about stuff, 
just like online now, I try to make sure it's kind of a balance between just like, you know, this is how this worked with this context it with me, or, you know, this is, remember, we're talking about the marathon here versus the hundred mile distance. That's a big difference. And just making sure people kind of understand like the nuances and the context of everything before going wholesale on any one approach for something that's maybe completely unrelated to what the person who had the success that they learned about it from was doing. And then kind of getting themselves to this position where, okay, now I'm armed with the pros of this approach as well as the cons. And then like, which one is going to kind of like, well, how do I piece together a scenario for me personally, that's going to produce the most pros and the least amount of cons <laughs> and then, and then start to develop that individualized approach that, that you kind of talked about. Well, and that's, you know, that's coaching, right? That's mm-hmm. how, you know, you can buy training plans, you can buy nutrition plans, you can buy any kind of plan. And, you know, if you can self coach yourself, that's great. But at the end of the day, it's the context that always matters. Mm-hmm. You know, all my questions and probably all of your questions with athletes, you know, are always, Hey, we have this objective metric data. Well, what did you do? I, if I, if you don't know what you did and I don't know what you did, these numbers are actually kind of meaningless a lot of times. Right? Mm-hmm. So it's always just that context. And again, that kind of goes back into that detective investigative work. You know, you just have to be curious and you just got to love to figure things out. Right. Like mm-hmm. I want to know why this happened and, also realizing a lot of times I'm not going to come up with a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, like- and I find, I find it sometimes if I'm doing say like a 60 minute consultation call, sometimes I'm asking questions for the first 30 minutes mm-hmm. and then we get 30 minutes in. I'm like, so far you've paid me just to ask you questions, <laughs> but that's what you have to do. It's like, we, let's like you said, if they have a result and they want to find out how they got to that result, whether it's a good one or a bad one or somewhere in between, we do have to reverse engineer everything and find out, well, what produced that result. And then once we do that, then we can start playing around with that order of operations you actually took to get that result in a way that's going to either produce a better result or kind of explain. So in some cases it is just explain to you why you felt as good as you did, which I'm not getting as many consultations for that. Cause usually if people are having great <laughs> success, they're like, well, why am I going to pay him to tell me what to do when it's already going well? But um, you do have people who are curious and they want to know like why doing something completely different worked well for them. And it didn't work that same way for their friend, but uh, it is, it's, it's, it's an exciting part of that, that side of thing from the coaching side. But um, I did want to ask you, Doug, uh, just in general with, uh, with Verda, cause I know when most people hear Verda, they probably think of like the online coaching mm-hmm. from just more of a, like a, a, like a nutrition standpoint from like say a dietitian or a doctor or, mm-hmm. you know, managing their diabetes or whatever it is how does like your role fit into that, that concept? Are you like, are you paired up with like a doctor and then you're kind of like the point person to help them navigate a lot of the like kind of day-to-day stuff. And then the bigger, like, you know, medical related type things get kind of pushed up the chain to someone who's got like an MD or something like that. Yeah. I think Jeff covered that when he did the first one. Yeah. So every, every patient that comes in gets assigned a a medical provider could be a, a physician or a nurse practitioner that basically oversees, you know, all the, all the medical stuff. So, you know, medication changes. And if, you know, somebody has a medical question or they have a, another medical condition that kind of presents, you know, people are still stuff, other stuff happens, right. You know, any kind of questions that, you know, legally, but also, you know, like I'm not a doctor. I mean, I'm not answering you know medical questions. You can't do that legally and you probably mm-hmm. shouldn't do it. Um, you know, just, <laughs> it's good practice anyway. Um, and that side, and then, yeah, you know, so the day-to-day conversations and, um, you know, the nutrition questions, you know, and really, really any other health related questions. I mean, I think being a, you know, even though we do focus mostly on nutrition, but being well-rounded and I've always thought of myself as a generalist, you know, but a lot of that came from doing it to myself. Like I realized my sleep was important, you know, so I've dug into it certainly not an expert, but, you know, I've got some tips, tricks, things we can try that, you know, exercise. Hey, let's just start walking. And really, you know, I really like the use of tiny habits. Hey, let's go on a five minute walk today. The barrier is so low. You're probably not going to tell yourself you don't want to do it. Let's just get that consistency going. And if you want to try other things, if you want to bounce stuff off us, um, you know, and I think a lot of, we get a lot of questions of, internet, which I'm sure doctors get as well. You know, everybody comes in with their newest Google search and Facebook post of things. So, 
I think, uh, you know, being able to read research and interpret things and, you know, really, I think coaching is teaching, right? And I don't, you know, so I try to give, you know, as many answers. And if things are unclear, it's a lot of times jumping on the phone and explaining the nuance of all these things and the complexities and helping people understand, you know, why they would want to do this or why do they want to do that. And I think that's a lot of medicine I coming around to this shared decision making. It's not this paternalistic, well, we're going to tell you to do this, right? Hey, this is what we think is best. And here's why. And then, you know, how would you feel about making this change? Um, you know, how is this going to impact your life, right? We're going to ask you to do a bunch of things. How's your time? How are your relationships? Are we asking too much of you? Right. You know, there are some limits in there as far as, you know, safety and medical care and stuff like that. But we're always trying to get this comprehensive approach of, you know, what are you willing to do? What are you able to do? What can we help you do? You know, and how can we help you do it? You know, and to me, the eye is always on that long term sustainability. It's we could do anything for a week. I mean, Mm -hmm. literally anybody on the planet, I think, could do anything for a week. But can we do it for a year? can we do it for five years? Can we do 10 years? And, you know, that, that's probably the ultimate success for a coach is somebody doesn't need me anymore. Like, so we call it graduating when somebody graduates the program, they don't need me anymore. They don't need us anymore. I mean, that is success. And then I think we might not ever see the the true long-term success, but if they didn't need us or anyone else, five, 10, 20 years down the road, and they're able to, you know, self-care and take care of themselves and coach themselves and use the skills and the tools and everything that they've developed with us. I mean, that's, and that's, you know, it's just the teach a man to fish, right? You know, I mean, yeah. that's, really, that's really what we're always trying to do. Awesome. Well, Doug, uh, I've taken up a fair bit of your time, but I want to give you an opportunity to let the listeners get an idea of where they can find you if you're active on social media or if there's a, a link to you on the Virta webpage or something that you can direct people to. Yeah. yeah. So I got, you know, the Twitter, I just got Instagram, which really right now is just like uh, you know, bike porn. <laughs> 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 like, Oh, look at that bike. You know, I get a billion dollars on bikes and um, you know, running and stuff like that. And I'll put a, I'll put a plug for my wife. She's a, a birder. She's a photographer. She does oh, great. Cool. You can follow her. That might be more interesting if you like birds. Um, but she's STL Birder on Instagram. Okay. Um, there and then I've got you know Facebook, Twitter. Oh, Twitter I love. It's like it's where I get all my studies. Like there's so much great. You know, for all the negative sides of it, it's a great place to curate. Oh yeah. Exercise, me- metabolism studies, all those kind of things. And then Facebook, and then yeah, on Verda. Um, yeah, the main website's just www.vertahealth.com. And all the links are on there and like all the links to the clinical trial papers. And we're going to continue publishing more of those. Um, you know, if you're interested in learning more about low carb and the ketogenic diet, you know, the, the blog's very good. Um, even if you were more interested in the technical side, I think there's a lot of interesting things, you know, you can get from there. And um, yeah, that's, that's a great place to, to learn more about us. And, you know, obviously if you have any questions, definitely reach out on social media. I, not overwhelmed with dms so i'm happy to respond so. awesome well we'll see yeah. if we can overwhelm you a bit doug <laughs> no but anyway i will link those to the show notes folks so if you are interested in connecting with doug feel free to check that side of things out otherwise thanks a bunch for having you coming on doug and sharing kind of your story and just a little bit more about the coaching side of things in general as well as kind of how that fits within the verta program i think the listeners are going to enjoy enjoy our conversation no great yeah and they're are you still running across America? Yeah, we're going to, I'm going to launch that. I think in early September is the plan at the moment. I've, I, I've, I'm starting to kind of put together kind of the logistics behind it and get all that stuff organized. So it's looking like that'll be the time to do it. And so about two months of, of my year will be starting in San Francisco and ending in New York. So it'll be an exciting uh, I don't know how it couldn't be a life-changing experience. <laughs> so I, I may be a different person come October, 2021. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, we'll, we'll keep an eye on Iowa is pretty close in Nebraska or wherever you're going to go mm-hmm. through. You going to film it all. You can make a documentary out of it. Yeah. We're going to do a lot of different stuff. I think it's going to be like a ton of like in the moment, social media type stuff from like both my Instagram accounts, as well as my wife's and um, Justin Wren, the guy who, 
who started the foundation that I'm raising, raising awareness and money for fight for the forgotten. Mm -hmm. He, I mean, he's had a lot of life-changing stuff this year. So like, I don't know how available he'll be during the project itself, but I know he, if he can do it, he's going to try to be along for part of it too. So I'm sure there, his, uh, his Instagram page and stuff will have a lot of day-to-day stuff. We're going to be recording tons of stuff. We've had some, some like documentary type offerings from some places and things like that too. So uh, I think it's going to be pretty well documented and I think there'll be a lot of, a lot of stuff coming out of that one from the, the video audio side of things, hopefully. Yeah, that's great. And then um, it was funny. I saw Tucker Goodrich on Twitter was thinking, I was thinking I was going to skip that Justin Wren episode. Oh yeah. <laughs> Don't and skip Justin Wren episodes. <laughs> yeah. So if anybody's listening to our episode and you do skip the Ju- Justin Wren episode, you have to go back and listen to Justin. I mean, obviously I, I didn't know that part of his story. And when, you know, he, I'm like MMA. I mean, I've heard him on Joe Rogan and then he mm-hmm. starts going, I'm like, you had me at alcoholism. Now I'm, I'm fully invested in actually paying attention. And it's just, yeah. I mean, I love, I don't love hearing people going through those things, obviously, but you know, I get a lot of value out of other people telling their story and it certainly helps me. Um, so that was, that was great that, you know, he came on and told his story and it was really impactful for me personally. So. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing about that interview too, is he's got a whole nother story that goes along with all that stuff that we talked about that we didn't even get into about his, okay. just because when he was, a, I mean, he was severely bullied. I think he mentioned that, but yeah, yeah. we didn't, we didn't actually get into any of like, he's got, he's got tons of stories about it too, where he mm-hmm. t- says exactly what his experience was like and how that affected him and how it led to a lot of that, that uh, abuse of drugs and things like that. Um, as well as, you know, it's, it's always, there's always pros and you know, like we talked about in this interview, you know, like his, his drive is massive. So like, you, you know, it goes from him being over in the Congo and, you know, building wells for people that, not too long ago, weren't even considered humans. And, uh, you know, you have that side of him, but then, you know, that same kind of drive can lead you down, down pathways that can be destructive too, especially if you start like burning the candle on both ends too often and things like that. So, so yeah, he's got, we, we, we didn't go as deep into that just cause he's told that story a bunch of times on other podcasts. So I thought if we were going to like, uh, dive into some stuff in more detail. We do some things that he hasn't talked about as much about. So, um, but yeah, he, his Rogan interviews are great with, for that side of things too, but awesome. Awesome. Doug, thanks so much for, for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the human performance outliers podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please consider checking out my website at zackbitter.com or my social media channels at zackbitter on Instagram at ZBitter on Twitter, and at Zach.Bitter on Facebook. You can also support the show by subscribing and leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform. If you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to send me an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.